every revolution begins with a revelation. Every revolution begins with a revelation. In other words, someone wakes up and says, this has to change. Something has to change. The question on Sunday was, why not you and why not now? Uh, you have the capacity, you have the anointing, you have the ability to cause great change in your family, in your generations, even in your community, even in your city, and even in your state. Um, so I want to encourage you tonight uh, to be a revolutionist in regards to the way your life is going. Um, if, if there's something that is not operating in fairness and justice according to the will of God and and the word of God in your life, be anti that. Be diametrically opposed to it. And I really do believe that this is the vocabulary of Jesus Christ when he said the kingdom of God suffered violence and they that advance it have that attitude. They have an attitude of aggressiveness that says, you know what, there's nothing going to limit me, nothing going to restrict me, nothing going to hold me back, nothing going to hem me in. I'm going to be everything that God ordained me to be. Can you say amen to that? So every revolution is marked by change. Um, you can see it. We said it Sunday. You see it expressed in everything from fashion to style to sound. Uh, every revolution, every time, every season, every generation is earmarked by certain characteristics. I was thinking today about the message Pastor Dustin preached at the first of the year, and I was so very impressed. Um, with the way that he talked about Jeremiah chapter 1. Now, I went back and read it again today, and several things jumped off the page for me, and I just want to bring them out for you tonight because it's important for us to understand um, that when prophets prophesy in the Old Testament, that they're not prophesying outside of the realm of a kingdom or an institution or something that God has set up in the earth or against something that is set up, against what God set up in the earth. So when you read uh, the words of the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Malachi, Haggai, Zephaniah, Zechariah, all of those prophets, they are saying something in response and reaction to something that's happening in the earth. So when you read Jeremiah, I love the way he prophesies. And his prophecy, Pastor Norris, is in direct relation to Josiah. Now we know that Josiah... Uh, is anointed king when he's eight years old. And then eight years later, 16 years old, he begins to cleanse Judah and Jerusalem of all the images and molten images and high places and groves. And then another eight years, he goes in, he cleanses the temple, and he's crying, where is the word of God? Boy, and this thing will preach because it, the Bible says he found the word of God in the house of God. But no one, had, no one had thought to look that the word of God just might be lost in the house of God. And so he finds it. But the prophecy of Jeremiah is in direct relation to Josiah's reformation. Now, Josiah is known as a reformer. But every great reformer has this kind of push and motivator next to them or behind them called a prophet. And the prophet for Josiah, in other words, his encourager or his motivator, was Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah is so honest in his approach to prophecy. In chapter 1, he says the word of the Lord. You can read it for yourself, verses 1 through 3. He names all the ancestry that he came from. He even names the tribe of Benjamin at one point. Then he says the word of the Lord came to me in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. Isn't that in interesting? The word of the Lord came to me the 13th year of Josiah's reign. And he says, uh, basically, and I won't read it tonight for the sake of time, but basically he says, I I'm a child. Lord, I'm a child. And the Lord speaks to him and says, say not, I am a child. And I, because what? I will put my words in your mouth. And then he goes on to explain to him, and you can read it from the screen or off your Bible, whatever. He says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. That's deep stuff because that denotes the idea that there was a relationship before conception. So there was a beginning before a birth. 
So your beginning didn't happen when you were born. Your beginning happened in eternity. So there's this, he said, I knew you. And the, the insinuation is we knew each other before you were formed in your mother's womb. And he says, it's almost a reminder. I ordained you to be a prophet, not when you were born, but with what? Before you were born. So I want to really remind you tonight as we go on intercession that when you tap into purpose in the earth and cause and reason for existence, it answers the why of life. Why are you here? You are re-encountering what you already said yes to. Okay, so it's, it, there, you shouldn't be surprised. Every yes is faced with great difficulty. Let me tell you, man, difficulty looks for people that have a yes in their mouth. <laughs> the devil looks for, for, let me tell you something, the devil ain't worried about nobody that's on the starting line. He's worried about those that respond to the sound of the gun, the gun and actually start running. And so um, he, he says, he says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And then he says, I ordained you to be a prophet. Now, let me show you the power of before, before I, before I finish this. The Bible says before the foundations of the earth, Jesus was crucified. That's scripture, y'all. So it, all, it was over before it started. Therefore, God's plan, James, is never, ever in jeopardy. Because he starts with the end, Isaiah says, and he gives the end a beginning. That's strong. So the start of the end was your before. That's strong stuff. So he says, before the foundations of the earth, Christ was crucified. Um, you can look at John the Baptist. The Bible talks about John concerning Elizabeth and says before John was born, he was named. That's strong. Um, before you were born, all the days of your appointed time were written before one of them came to pass. I really believe that it's high time for believers to get in touch. Before in Hebrew is interesting because it means anterior also superior gives two notions number one anterior has to do with roots that when you touch that part of your existence that before you were birthed you had a beginning your beginning was not when you were born your beginning was in eternity that when you touch that and you understand that your anterior is so strong that you are practically immovable it doesn't mean you escape the wind. It doesn't mean you don't have to face the storm. But it means you do not uproot. You do not topple. You, you always bounce back. Amen. And so that's why I encourage people. If you've got to come to the altar a hundred times to get it right, that's all right. You're just facing a little more wind than the rest of us right now. Right? So it's not only anterior, but it's also superior. So that your ordination in your before existence is superior to anything you're going to face in life. Man, that's strong. So your ordination was so strong with God before you got here that it is so, so far superior than any trouble, than any problem, than anything you'll ever face. You got the victory before you started. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Now let me show you the power of that. The power of that is... People that die with that understanding never die frustrated. They just leave. And they leave, and it could be in the most unusual ways, but they just leave. They don't worry about death because death is just a passing. Amen? So I want to encourage you tonight. And, and then he gives him six radical um, assignments, Dr. B. Six he said, I ordained you to be a prophet, and here's your assignments. What's, what's number one, Josh? Number, number one, the first thing you are ordained to do is root out. That, that's strong stuff. Root out anything that's in your life. Expel, pull up, pull up anything. You, you have the anointing to do it. 
Amen. Go ahead, Josh. Number two. To pull down, tear down, break down, break off, cast down, or to break out. What, is, what does 2 Corinthians say, Josh? 2 Corinthians 10. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. To the what? Pulling down. That's what Jeremiah, God had said, you're anointed to pull stuff down. So he says, watch, cast down images, imageries, imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Everybody say these words with me. I can do that. Can do that. Amen. You can do that, y'all. Pull it down and make that thing obedient in Jesus' name. All right, number three, Josh. Number three, he says, I ordained you and anointed you to destroy, which means to completely annihilate. This is in direct accordance with what uh, Jesus, uh, the prophet, uh, or the letter of 1 John, where John says of Jesus that Jesus was sent or made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, Christ is the anointed one of God. You are anointed with Christ's anointing. Can you say amen to that? You are anointed to destroy the works of the devil. Annihilate them. Amen. Cause them to vanish, to blot them out, exterminate. Go ahead, Josh. Cause them to give up. Yeah, that's a strong definition, right? To cause to give up. Everyone say this with me. I will outlast this thing. Amen. You will. When, this, when, the, when the crisis is over, you'll still be standing. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, go ahead, Josh. And then uh, the fourth part is to throw down, to, which means to overthrow, to dispose, to vanquish, to overcome, or to defeat, or to overturn. What's our scripture there, Josh? To overthrow. In that day, uh, or again, in Haggai chapter 2, verse 20 through 23, you have to read it all. It's, it's about kingdoms, environments, cultures, uh, strongholds. You are anointed to deal with those things, to throw them down. So you can't say that I was born in a certain kind of culture, certain kind of class. Throw it down. Bump your neighbor and tell them, throw that down. Amen. That don't have no stronghold on you. It has no halt on you. Amen. Next one, Josh. Now watch. The first four... It's interesting, uh, Pastor Norris, because it all has to do with uprooting, pulling down, throwing down, destroying. And you think, man, this is a violent kind of anointing. <laughs> but then the next, here comes the good part. He says, number, number six is to build. Everybody say this with me. Or, or number five, I'm sorry, is to build. Everyone say this with me. I am a builder. <laughs> Amen. I, I've learned something in ministry. There's two kinds of people. There are those that build, and those are gatherers. And then there are those that bring destruction. Those are scatterers. The word build is always in Hebrew language connected to family. It always has to do with children, sons and daughters. As a matter of fact, every time you see in the Hebrew language, the Old Testament, the word sons, it's always in reference to builders. Yeah, so here's what I say. When I'm, for example, if I'm looking for spiritual sons in the earth as a spiritual father, I'm looking for guys that want to build. Do you, do, do you want to build? If you want to build, then, you, you know, you're, you, you'd be a good son. But everybody don't want to build, right? Now, what do you mean, Bishop Bill? Build the encouragement of other people. Builders help other people. Builders encourage other people to be all they can be. Right? Builders show up when there's a job going on. I'm going to say that one one more time. Builders show up when there's a job going on. Like right now, the job is consecration. So don't think I'm not paying attention to, uh, to who's here and who's not here. Because I want to know what the future looks like. Who can we use in the future that we can depend on when we get ready to build another church or to build a satellite ministry? or to establish a mission in Mexico, whatever our next move is, who am I looking at? Who am I going to work with? Well, I'm certainly not going to ask people to come alongside me and build that's not present. Amen? And then, and then number six is to plant. And I find that interesting because you would think, Mike, it would be reversed. You would think it would be plant and build. 
But no, it's build and plant, which means never get too satisfied and stationary in one situation. Because as soon as you get one thing established, God says it's time to plant. And then what do you do? Build. So you plant and you build. And God is all about planting his people. So we build and what? We, be, we need to get that. I really believe that's one, one reason why we've seen some delays and stuff. Because we stopped planning. We built and we stopped. We have to build and plant. Amen.